Does anyone not know? <laughs> what is it? I have no idea. We'll see. All right. Well, I'll get into it. So my name is Rob Crittenden. I'm going to talk about Project Dipsilon and Federated Identity. So meet Joe. Joe's just your average guy. Likes using the web. He's got a bunch of different identities. He, he's got a work identity. He's got a home identity. He might be a gamer. He might be a blogger. A lot of people know him in a lot of different ways. He really likes to use the web. Uh, this is typical. You log into the website. They have a local user database. He does this all over the place. Um, the problem is he's got passwords for everything, uh, different usernames, um, and he's not always good at, at getting a new password or choosing good passwords because uh, he's just an average dude. Um, so there are fixes for this. You can think LastPass, uh, lots of other tools to help you consolidate have one password, which unlocks all the others. Um, Federation is another solution. So uh, you basically have one account. Uh, the asterisk there because you can actually have multiple accounts, one for each identity. You might have a work identity and a home identity and a gaming identity, etc. It's trying to oversimplify things a little bit. Um, so this is good because then you have one password per, per account anyway. And you don't have to remember all the stuff and hopefully you have a better password. Um, it's good for the web applications that, that use federated identity because no, they no longer have to do password resets. And they don't have to worry about getting their database hacked and having all the passwords stolen and notify everybody. Um, and it's also some uh, federation uh, can be good for um, administrator head with um, people leaving too. So, for example, in a work environment, if you have federation, you can log into Oracle and Salesforce and a lot of other things. Um, when you leave, uh, they don't have to go to Salesforce and delete you and go into Oracle and delete you and go into the HR system and delete you. They just delete you out of the federated identity system and you're gone. And you can't log in anywhere. Um, this is a very simplified version of what federation looks like. So Joe goes to example.org, uh, which wants authentication. So his browser redirects him to an identity provider of some sort. He provides some sort of authentication. It's validated locally there. And then he's redirected back to example.org with some sort of token. And this token identifies who he is. And it might say some things about him. It might say his name, his address, his email address, um, or other interesting facts. Um, this is not federation. This is stolen straight from CMO. Um, this is uh, example.org is basically sending your password onto another site. Uh, you can't control your credentials this way. Uh, this is totally not safe. It's literally a man in the middle. Um, it's a terrible idea. Um, so some general information about federation. Um, you're basically outsourcing your identity. Now, outsourcing might not be very far. It might be outsourcing to IT. Um, but you could be giving, turning to somebody else. For example, Google is an open ID provider. So uh, they're providing identity for you. Um, so they're strictly a third party. Um, usually these are HTTP based protocols. Uh, it doesn't have to be. Um, and they're usually done in a browser. So there are rich clients. Um, you can do SAML is one of the uh, federation uh, technologies and you can use that from the command line. Um, but typically they're browser based. Um, some use cookies for state, some don't. Um, and then there's, uh, I'll get into this in a minute, there's a centralized or decentralized federation. Um, and then here's some common examples of you may have heard of. Um, so we'll start with SAML. So this is centralized. So by centralized, it means there's one identity provider. Um, it may have multiple instances, uh, but there's one place that you go for identity. Um, it's, it was created in like 2001 or so, and the last um, spec with SAML 2 came out in 2006. It's pretty stable, uh, but because of the, t the time it came from, XML was hot then, so it's XML based, and it's horrible to read. Um, and it has to be over HTTPS because otherwise the content's readable. Um, and you, you have tokens going back and forth, so you, you definitely want SSL. Um, for SAML, it requires an uh, agreement between parties. So if you want to be a web provider uh, and deal with a, a SAML IDP, you have to exchange some information. So uh, it's called metadata. You basically exchange keys so that when you get an identity from the SAML uh, identity provider, you can confirm that it's from them using a signature. Um, and it can even be encrypted if you really want to go that far. Um, SAML provides cross domain single sign on. And what that means is so cookies are, are domain specific. 
Um, but with SAML, um, the, the cookie is for the IDP. Um, and so you go to the IDP and you get your cookie, and then you provide additional data to the, to the service provider, which can be in any number of domains. Um, and so you can get cross domain single sign on that. Um, SAML also has single logout. So if you log into a bunch of different websites, you can click one button and log out all of them at the same time, um, which is pretty spiffy. I'll, I'll go over that. Now this is a very similar picture we saw before. Uh, Joe here in non-stick figure form uh, starts by going to a service provider. Service provider is a fancy way of saying website. Um, the, it, the service provider doesn't see a cookie for Joe, so it redirects him to the IDP, and his browser takes care of this. Um, the IDP it's going to present some sort of page uh, that's going to say authenticate. Now, you can authenticate any way you want to the IDP, whatever way it supports. Um, and this is another advantage of uh, federation is that you, Joe's web service isn't going to want to have, you know, one-time passwords and Kerberos and uh, a lot of other, you know, more difficult, somewhat more difficult authentication mechanisms where an IDP is all they do. Uh, so you can, typical is Kerberos, um, LDAP backend authentication, simple form based, uh, one time passwords, it, whatever you want. Uh, once you're authenticated, uh, SAML issues a token, sends that back through Joe's browser to the SP, recognizes the token, and away you go. Uh, inside the token for SAML are what are called attributes, and these attributes contain information about you. Um, they might contain what groups you're in. Um, your email address, um, things like that. And it, it can also contain additional information, which is kind of beyond this talk, but this is a basic overview. This is what single logout looks like. Um, I, I had to grossly oversimplify this because the lines got a little crazy. Um, but basically, Joe logs out of Search Provider 1. And the first thing that SP1 does is it redirects back to Joe's browser and sends it to the IDP, because the IDP is where all the where real action happens. So the IDP uh, looks for all the login sessions that it has for Joe. Um, and then it's going to one by one iterate over those and log them all out until the only one left is the originating logout request. And so in this case, I'm showing logout over SOAP, uh, which is basically an HTTP post. Um, you can also do redirect logouts, and that's actually recommended by um, the SAML specification, but it was impossible to draw. <laughs> so, so basically, it logs out of Search Provider 2, uh, once the IDP sees that everything else except for the original one's logged out, it logs them out of there and then redirects back to the service provider and he's done. Um, and if Joe went back to any other provider, he would have to authenticate it. Um, open ID is another pretty common um, federated identity solution. It's decentralized in that you can have uh, identity providers anywhere. Your identity is the URL. Uh, and the URL basically contains information that says who you are and, and who's going to authenticate you. Um, and basically with OpenID, you prove that you own this URL um, by providing the password. Um, and with OpenID, you can run your own server if you wanted to. It seems a little hardcore, but you could if you wanted. Um, so the OpenID itself is, like I said, it's just an URL, and it could be whatever. The only thing, like for example, my URL, let me skip forward one slide. I'm marketing that idea of the URL project. This is, so you know something about me, you know my, my FAST login because of Mark Curtin. You know I'm related to your project, so you, you have some idea about who I am. But otherwise, you, don't, you can't glean any other information out of it. Um, so and similar to, to SAML, um, uh, you can provide via consent any number of different attributes. Um, and it, it, OpenID is extensible, so depending on what extensions are available, uh, defines what data is visible. Um, so, oh, goodness sake. So this is, well, when you fetch this URL, you're gonna get something that looks like this, and part of it is OpenID server, and so we know to go to id.fedoraproject.org. So uh, when you try and authenticate with this, it's gonna redirect you there to log in. Uh, there's actually a pretty complex uh, discovery process uh, where the URLs can be much more, the, the, the data contained with the URL can be much more complex, but like I said, I'm just trying to give you a basic overview. So then what happens is a, a, a shared secret is established between the, uh, it, so I, I've been using the term service provider and IDP and SAML. It's identity provider and relying party in OpenID. So the relying party establishes a shared secret with the identity provider directly. 
and then uh, the user is redirected to the identity provider to authenticate, and, and similar to what we saw with SAML, they provide authentication somehow. And again, this could be more complex than uh, the relying party wants to do itself. Um, the open ID doesn't use cookies, so um, it just its token goes back in the content of the HTTP response. Can I have a question? Sure. What's the main difference between uh, open ID and SAML? I kind of um, well, I mean, the protocol-wise, they're conceptually they're similar, but open ID is um, is just an URL, um, and in this URL, it, it tells a lot of information about where to go to the IP. Um, you don't need to register the service provider with um, the open ID provider, for example. Like in, in SAML, you have to you have to exchange keys. Um, open ID does it on the fly. Um, so you couldn't have like a rogue ser service provider in SAML. It's it's centralized. So you have to have a handshake. Um, open ID is not so much. So I can actually use my Fedora project open ID anywhere I want um, within reason. Um, if they accept, if they accept open ID and accept right, and you cannot trust other open ID providers. If you want, uh, you can actually set up a chain of who I trust and who I don't. But um, for the most part, it's it's so that's cool. on the relying party. On the relying party, it's pretty friendly. Right. So the relying party, the consuming service, in open ID case, defines what central servers it, it trusts and accepts, and it can be anything that supports open ID, right? In SAML, you have a more control. It's like the IDP registers the registers the service itself. One is the open ID is more for collaboration between different services that are independent, while SAML is more for the federation between the services that are related and know about each other at the order. So, what's Epsilon? Halfway through the talk. Uh, Ypsilon provides OpenID and SAML uh, as a service. Um, so it consists of pretty straightforward installation scripts that set these things up for you. Um, you know, this, this SAML and, and, Ips, and uh, OpenID are, are pretty easy to do, um, but there is some metadata to exchange and generate keys and things like that, so this greatly simplifies that. Um, and, and it lets you configure like, uh, so I talked about what attributes you can have, mailing address, email, et cetera. Uh, you can control who sees what, um, and sometimes even what it's called, because the different providers expect different names. Um, there's a management GUI uh, in a plugin framework, um, and IPA can be a backend identity. Um, so this is what you see when you log into Ypsilon itself, pretty friendly administrative GUI. Uh, I'll go over each of these. So e each of these links basically is, is a major uh, set of plugins. So um, uh, each provider in that case is a federation protocol, so we support SAML2. Um, so SAML is a quite large specification, and they actually have a conformance document. Um, Ypsilon is the IDB Lite, which doesn't, it makes it sound like it doesn't do much, but it actually, it's about half the spec. Um, the most used parts anyway, from what our perspective anyway. Uh, OpenID, and it supports FAS, so uh, I assume everyone here has got a, a FAS account. Let's say you've been using Ypsilon about the last three weeks. Um, so, uh, and then Mozilla Persona is another uh, provider that we, we support. Um, it's an email-based, well, yeah, it's an email-based login system. Um, it's not super interesting. Uh, so login mechanisms uh, that we support right now with GSS API, which means you have Kerberos. Uh, there's form-based authentication, um, which uses, so Apache's got a whole bunch of modules. Mod, uh, intercept form submit is the one that we use. So basically it intercepts the form and then does the authentication for you within Apache rather than submitting to like a WSGI and having it do the authentication. It could do that too. Um, for backends, you can log in uh, via LDAP, PAM, or the Fedora account system. Um, and then information providers, this is where we get the attributes to fill in the information about you. Um, so by default, the things available are like uh, the groups you're in, mailing list you have, uh, things like that. Um, we can get the data over SSSD, it's InfoPipe, which is a DBus interface. Um, so if you have open, if you have free IPA, then anything in free IPA is available as an attribute. 
and sing for the menu. Um, you can also in, uh, get data via LDAP, which is almost the same thing as SSSD. It's just a little more complex to set up and you need extra identities. Um, or you can just get rid of NSS, but you get your geckos. That's about it. Uh, so, and I mentioned before, you can configure data visibility. So if you have a service provider, you don't want to know people's addresses, you can uh, limit to, to name only or name and email. Um, or some providers, uh, there's uh, interoperability differences between SAML providers and, and OpenID providers. They, some might want email as the email address, and some might want mail as the email address. And so you can do mapping of, of attribute names. Um, so let me, uh, it's one thing to talk about it. Let me see if I can actually show you um, what Epsilon looks like. All right, so I'm going to install an Ypsilon server with IPA as the back end, uh, configuring the, uh, the SSD info pipe uh, with all the form based authentication, and I'm going to enable OpenID too. So, SAML by default is enabled. Um, so, it, it's going to look and say, I already have a key tab. This machine is enrolled as an IPA client, um, which also simplifies the certificates that we need. Um, and that's it. We now have an IDP. So if I go to my browser, I have a showing character. Okay, so I can authenticate. How's it showing? Oh, that's fine. So I, I can log in as my IPA administrator, which is the same name as the Ypsilon administrator. So it all just works. And I have my, my friendly page where I can flip through and I can show you. So we have OpenID and SAML configured. Um, we have GS API because of IPA, uh, form based authentication. Um, test auth is not something that's interesting for most people. Um, yes, yeah, it basically it's let anybody in. Uh, and then SSSD is enabled, and NSS is disabled because you don't need them both enabled at the same time because they both, it's the same information. Um, so now this really gets interesting. We have a service provider, so let's set up a SAML. So um, let me go over this. So the SAML IDP metadata, so this is basically saying, I'm setting up a, a service provider, and this is where you can get the identity provider's metadata. Um, and then the SAML auth is what I'm protecting. Um, and then I'm going to automatically register this SP with Ypsilon without having to do a lot of metadata exchange myself. So I basically just provide the password and it registers for me over a REST API. Um, Do you need to have this client be enrolled in IP? Or I, 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 you don't. No, the client doesn't because all the, all, all the identity stuff happens on the IDP. I do because it, it makes us so easier. So I can use IP to get certs for everybody mm -hmm. and then um, I don't have trust issues. Um, yeah, you, you also don't even need to use Epsilon client installers. So Right. Yeah, but the the the, uh, the uh, Ypsilon client install is in Linux. It's, 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 but the question is, what are the requirements? Right? Do you have to have IPA? No, you, have, you, you don't, don't have to have, have IPA. IPA. Is it just this command, or you have to do a lot of manual stuff to, for this command to work? Or it's basically it? just this. So I mean, if, if you think of SAML, you know, a, a common case is somebody has their own IP. So here's SP test, the provider we just added. Let me, uh, let me explain why I have all my clients in, in involved enrolled in IPA. So you can manually add a provider here too, so you can just give it some friendly name like you know, Joe's. Uh, um, now for the metadata URL, you know, you probably want to, if you wanted to provide the metadata over SSL in you know, HTTPS, blah, 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 blah. Well, 
when you submit, it's going to open an SSL connection to that service provider. And if the CA trust isn't there, then things don't work so great. So that's why being in the same PKI is, is easy, or use certs that are issued from some well-known provider or is already in your cert bundle. Um, but so what does it do? It connects to the SP. SAML, uh, to the mode of SAML effectively. It, right. To whatever is in there. The, the right, but if it's protected by mod SSL or mod NSS, then it, the TLS connection needs to be trusted too. And if you have, so if you install this using uh, locally issued self-signed certs everywhere, then it's not going to work out too well. It's because you need to distribute, because you need to You need a CA, CA. Right. Okay. right. So using IPA, you have a central uh, CA as well, so it simplifies things, it's not mandatory. And this, you know, all, all these things are not open. a problem to overcome, it's just for demo purposes it was easier okay. to do it this way. So how this is different, so you're now adding manual in, this is the alternative way of installing Yes. Uh, right. So if you use Modoff Melon, you're pure, just plain Modoff Melon, and you, uh, when it starts up, it generates its own metadata. Mm -hmm. And so once you have your search router running, all you have to do is go in here and provide the URL to where that metadata is, and it'll just slurp it over the interweb. And how trusted is this to get this? I mean, how you authenticate the first exchange? Um, so the 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 SAMP, the SP metadata is based uh, use, already has the IDP metadata, so it uh, is signed by the the IDP public key, right? There's, there are three ways there. They can talk to your provider. Uh, two of them are out of band. Either you get a file on your machine and you upload it. So the trust in this case, you are logged in as an admin user. Right. Okay. Or you copy and paste it, same. And the only one where you have some trusted issues is the metadata URL. And you really want to use HTTPS there if you really want to keep the correct server. And that's why you want to have a CA and a certificate. Uh, uh, so you rely on the certificate. In this yeah. case, you are. And, okay. they, and you're relying on having the right, correct name. And Perhaps we should show what the metadata looks like. It's, it's awful. So this is what, let me pull this down a little bit. This is what the metadata looks like. So it's basically the, the public key of the, uh, this is the service provider. Um, and then it's got a bunch of entries for the things it supports. So it supports single logout, um, the uh, assertion consumer service, which, uh, and then the name IDs it supports. So uh, it's something in SAML you can actually, um, the name returned by the IDP doesn't have to be the name you log in with. Um, so it, it could be any number of things. It could actually be the same thing. It could be your, your Kerberos principal name. It could be a random UUID. Or it could be a random UUID that's always returned for you. And that way you can, you can link identities. Um, and it could be a number of other things. NT has one, uh, X509 subject, um, some other things. So let's... Um, Let's show it in action. So if I go to the secret site, oh, my my out my laptop is not enrolled in IPA. So when I when I try to access the uh, the secret site, I immediately get redirected to the uh, to Ypsilon. I'm going to log in as Joe. It authenticates me, and, and here I am back on my search provider. Um, we can look in the environment. I will see these melon underscore names. These are basically the attributes that we're, we're in the same assertion. So we have my full name is Joe User. Um, the, the group I'm in, I'm in a group IPA users. Uh, my phone number, it's got my mailing address. Um, and anything, any attributes that are allowed to be sent over will be listed here with the names. Now, um, the underscore zero bit 
Um, these are for multi-value. So if you were in a bunch of groups, you would have group zero, group one, group two, group three, group four, et cetera. Um, and same for any other attribute. Um, and I can log out. And I log back in, of course, it's gonna authenticate me. So I wanted to show single logout. So I'm gonna install a client on my uh, my uh, Ypsilon server as well. Um, just to, uh, I didn't want to start up another VM for another service provider. So, so I'm going to log back in here. If I provide the right password. Okay, so now if I go to This is the new SP I set up, and I, I just get right in because I authenticated over here. So I probably should have made them look a little different. <laughs> so, all right, so if I look at the environment, it's exactly the same because it's the same assertion. Um, you have all hosts? Well, yeah, so hosts will be in here only because Apache provides the, that information. Yeah, just, just to show that it's a different type. Uh, you can see it up here, uh, I, I guess. Uh, yeah, so this is ypsilon.example.com, this is that SP. And this is sptest.example.com. So, all right, so let me show you log out. Um, so I logged into, SP, into the SP on this tab. I'm gonna log out of the SP on this tab. So I click log out, and I'm logged back out. Okay, so now I still have this, right? But if I just refresh the page, Unauthorized. So, pretty cool. Um, all right, now I also have an open ID provider, and this worked last night. Let's see if it works. So, this is this is just some example code I grabbed from a, a another Ypsilon developer. Um, so, this is my it's him. Uh, th this is my URL, which is rather long and awful. Uh, it, it's configurable. Um, but so the same thing, I sign in. I'm going to be authenticated by Ypsilon. Um, if this is something you, you're familiar with fast, okay, you get a little dialog that says if someone's trying to authenticate you, um, how long do you want to be trusted, and, and, and I don't have any data to send. So, um, so if I allow it, I'm redirected back to this, and it failed. <sighs> okay. From the authorization part? I don't know. Yeah, it's his fault. He blew my demo. All right. Go back to the uh, open you can just enter ypsilon.example.com slash ID as zero. So it's long that example.com slash ID. That's it? Yes. I'm still authenticating. There we go. All right. So I went to the wrong place. Sorry about that. Now, notice that there's no name and email here, right? Because uh, I didn't set it up within Ypsilon. So um, let's. Uh, Remember, OpenID is, is full of extensions, and those extensions do things like, oh, they're logged in the wrong place. Um, so if I go into OpenID, so, these are the ex extensions available. So we have um, Fedora Teams, you know, it, it's really only relevant for FAST. So if I, simple registration is, provides like username uh, and email. Um, Ashby Exchange allows a lot more. Um, this is what the mapping looks like. So we can actually map one name to another um, or modify with the list of attributes that one's allowed to send. 
So, now if I sign in again. Of course, it didn't save. Ah, so, it, it sees I'm still logged in as administrator. So, but now we have a name here. So, and admin and IPA doesn't have a. Uh, password or the email address. So let me log out. The son is Joe again. Um, so so now we have, we have full name and email address as things that we're, we're consenting to send. Um, now if you ever use like OpenStack, their open IT provider actually asks you per attribute what you want to send. Um, that's something we could talk about adding, but um, for now it's, it's an all or nothing thing. So now, Joe and Joe user are sent. So, that's open ID. Um, and of course I have to flip the email. And I'm just gonna wrap things up. So this is where we're going. Uh, open ID Connect is under active development right now. Uh, OpenID itself is kind of deprecated, not too many people are using it anymore. Um, OpenID Connect is based on OAuth 2, and like Facebook and a lot of other companies are pushing for it. Um, uh, we're working on the IDP portal, so you can go to the IDP, and for example, for SAML, every SP that's registered to it will show. So if you have a company, and you have all your internal sites protected with SAML, then you can list everything that a user might want to go to. Um, and you can just click on it and be authenticated and go in the way. Or if you're already authenticated, then you just go into a single sign-on um, and everything's great. Uh, right now, the REST interface is only for registering service providers. Um, we're going to extend that to be able to do more stuff over REST. Um, and then we're still working on additional SAML profiles so we can claim full conformance. Um, so there's our website um, if you want to hack on it. Uh, patches are accepted. We're using Pegger. Uh, it's kind of like GitHub Lite right now, or it's GitHub Clone. Um, and it's working pretty well for us, um, you know, for patch reviews. And then we hang out in the comments a lot on Freenode. Um, and that's it. So, any questions, let me know. Have you guys done the test with AWS Federation at this point? No. No, we've. Um, Integration testing is another thing I didn't really put on there. Um, so, it was a simple PHP uh, SP we've tested with, and there was a one other, there was a... I yeah. think John tested with Shibboleth. What's that? Yeah, Shibboleth. Yeah. Shibboleth. So AWS, and there are a couple different ways they, they integrate via SAML. Um, one of them is what they call um, IDP initiated. Not. Not. Well, well, it's, well I, I mean, it's all CSS and stuff, but it's provided by the RPM, so if you, if you branded it and then. It's all templated, though. It's 
Yes, yeah, it's, uh, right, but it's really not, it's all done by the package. So, or if you go by the archive, right? It's all templated. It's just that we put all the templates in the same package. It's just about separating the templates in a separate package so you can remove it. Right, and replace it with your own. It's not like. It's not, nothing's hard coded. The only thing is that you use Battlefly to use this thing, which is the stuff we use in the actual app. So you need to know a little bit about how that works if you want to fancy stuff. What else? I mean, I have to write my own for password reset for IPA. So, so, so Fedora, uh, uh, you haven't seen the change in Fedora because Fedora needs to change the presentation. Yeah, we have a configurable template directory. So you can just create your own templates in other directory. You don't need to modify the RPM, just edit the configuration to point the other right. uh, directory. Okay, great. great. Yeah, we should all kind of think about for how, how to create. You should do the mail. How, how to do that because it's not part of all. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to train my users to or log into something. So they don't know. Yeah, absolutely. That's the whole point. Yeah. So that's why we make it templated in the right configuration. Yeah, you can take an hour. I got it. It's just about documenting how to do it. You got it? Yeah. Oh, good ticket. So, OTPs. They're really important. Multi factor off for me. Yeah, so you can do that. Yeah. With IPA behind it. Right. That's sort of the nice thing. We're still on two, so I don't have one. Yeah, so it's 
Stored with something that's specific to Epsilon? That would be Epsilon preferences. Okay. But things like your email address, what is your name look like, that has to come from the Okay. Right. So you help that yeah. or Well, we, we prefer that because it's more natural to keep that information where you don't actually have to But I didn't think for IBM, it's something that's more of a proxy. Your identity. So I'm going to keep it there. But for opening it, So here's Joe logged into Ypsilon. All he did was log back out. So. <laughs> Not really. I mean, I might eventually be able to yeah. see Some. what SPs you log in. Right. You know, but, right. But this is 1.0 today. It can't do much. I mean, really, you know, if you log into your IPA, there should be a dial for that. Let me go change my preferences to IPA. Yeah. And automatically. Right. Yeah. This is where you would see the portal stuff as well. Right. So right. So it would be a, a tile list of. You know, all the things, maybe a description off to the right hand side, you click on any one thing, and off you go. Okay. Cool. But IP is, so the question is, will IP be separated? And I don't think the IP will be a service provider. No, it wouldn't, it wouldn't show up on that list. Well, but if you use the Kerberos, you already have your ticket here. You'll yeah, but, but it's it. not formally open ID. No, but, but for example, we know that we. Ypsilon knows that IPA is integrated, so we could, if we see that, just stick one up anyway, because we would have all the information, yes. and, and yes. one can be sent over there. Your credentials, your Ypsilon credentials, probably wouldn't let you do much of IPA unless you logged in with Kerberos. Uh, so you well, may have to re-authenticate an IPA, which could be a little jarring. Yeah, IPA depends on the Kerberos principle over there internally. Right. You, it, you need the, the ticket, so only if you log authenticated using GST API you mm -hmm. could seamlessly get from one place to the other. Yeah, so you would have to detect on here that you have Kerberos infrastructure. Yeah, and and you logged in and you have an IP somewhere and well, we could put an icon. All we need to do is allow you to go back to the right place to check that the authentication was done to GST API. Yeah. If it was done to that, then your browser is working with Kerberos. Showing already that my users go to their IP and answer the portal, right? So most users can't handle it. Sure. Um, so but if there was a link from here portals, to go to it, they might write to, hey, here's all my attributes that I can add. Exactly. Then that would be helpful. Why is that? Why, why is it coming to that? Our level of confidence in technical terms is on the full spectrum. I mean, to, down to people who can't remember their password to unlock their computer. Level. So if they, if they have one page that they're used to going to and they have a there and, and a help desk level uh, education goes and says, here you go, this is how you use this, they might use it. But uh, actually having to go look up an article on where to go to your IPA management and what you need to change, it's mm -hmm. yeah, 
the level of success has been pretty low. It's more of a link than how complex you have the database, especially with agents that's really complex. Right. But you want to be able to say, here's the portal you go to, that is it. Right. right. And, and then you can follow what's on the page instead of looking up, oh, you know. But that's the idea of the IDP portal. So you, you learn to go to one place to do whatever's in the company, and yep. everything's linked there. Yep. Okay. You know, I'm, I'm just curious. So what, what kind of organization it is? It uh, it's a global media and entertainment company. Okay. We've got about 500 employees globally. There's a lot of cultural discourse. There's just a lot of technical challenges. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a blow up. So 50 plus companies brought mm -hmm. into one. Okay. Uh, so there's a lot of technology challenges there. And I'm, I'm putting IPA out as a competitor to doing a global AD trust. Simo and I are both former IP develop IPA developers, so we're keen on well, yeah, you guys. Okay. <laughs> Definitely helped me save our IPA around multiple times. Oh, okay. Well, good. <clears throat> we started back with one and, cool. and have moved everything forward since then. So I've done the same. Yeah. There's, there's some pain points yeah. every once in a while. Stop. Thank you. Oh, wow. Thank you. Thank you.